Okay, uh, welcome to 2022 uh, the lecture. This is a lecture to honor one of our former uh, professors, uh, Maurice uh, Yu, who made significant contributions in uh, problem mechanics. Actually, this contribution was not limited to problem mechanics, in applied mechanics, and structural mechanics, but only different views of mechanics. And uh, I just made a very brief introduction about our speaker today, uh, Professor Emmanuel De Tony. I actually heard about Professor De Tony like more than 28 years ago, but it directly is to uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, Dr. Alex Ted, at the University of Delaware. So one day, Alex asked me, oh, why don't we teach or teach a class of raw mechanics? So I'm handling those parts. That are more genetical like because uh, I went to uh, school. Many schools around the world, the picture making school, have raw mechanics programs. And then uh, Alex will be handling the portion, more theoretical part. And then the uh, monograph that Alex used was on the uh, fundamentals of power electricity. So that was uh, authored by Tony and Chen. So, and then it too many years uh, we met. And uh, Professor Dintoni uh, got his uh, bachelor's uh, from the University of Leeds, uh, Beijing. Maybe the pronunciation in French is different. But this is exactly the same place where uh, Dr. Bio came from. So it's a coincidence. And but uh, Dintoni is a great scholar as well as uh, Maurice Bio. And by looking at the research field uh, in petroleum biomechanics, <coughs> and his current uh, research focus are uh, building mechanics and mechanics of fluid movement and uh, fractures. And then he has more than 140 uh, papers, uh, publications, and, and patents. And then I think the one of the owners that we have mentioned is the members for the US National Academy uh, of Engineering. So Professor Dedoni, after getting the, uh, the bachelor's, he came to the U.S. Uh, and studied at the University of Minnesota. So currently, he is the Theodore uh, Bennett Chair Professor of the Mining and Road Mechanic at the Department of Civil Environmental and Realized the Technology Engineering now uh, for the Department in, in Minnesota. Uh, without uh, taking more time, let us uh, hand the podium to Professor Tony for his twenty twenty two election. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ling. And uh, I must say that first of all, before uh, speaking about uh, the topic of the the lecture, I would like to say that uh, I've it's not sorry, it's not seen on my screen here, but the contribution from uh, my Former postdoc, you know, uh, here we go. He's on the he's on the right there, and Yera Habakobian, who have been participating on the on the topic of this of this lecture. But um, most importantly, oh, why is not working out here? Is a way to kill that? Okay, thank you. Okay. I must say that I'm very honored to be here for the bio lecture because um, I have to say that. Maurice Bio was always my role model when starting uh, in graduate school. Um, and then I've been always looking at him. And as you said, the power mechanics part of his contribution is only a small, a very small part of what uh, Maurice Bio contributed. You know, he contributed hundreds of papers on, on various areas, you can see from here. I think earthquake engineering is actually one of his uh, early contributions but also folding stabilities of sedimentary layers. I mean, you name it. So it's, it's really a grand man. And that what you put, what you can see here on, on, the, on the site is, a, I was a co-organizer of the first BIOT conference. You know, the fourth one was held here in Colombia in 2009, where I was part of the, the organizing committee of the first one. And then that was held in Louvain, Louvain-la-Neuve in Belgium in 1998. And we put the CD together for all his collect paper, except for two. 
Uh, I still have a few copies at, at home. So if any one of you wants to have a copy, I'd be happy to send to you. Anyway, what, what I think was most, inter, most uh, enduring from Maurice Bio is the fact is the way he, he was modeled. And I think that was ele eloquently said by Raymond Mindlin no? in the tribute from the NAE, where he was mentioning this ability of Bio to simplify to develop models that were that had only essential components. And on top of that, he had all the mathematical skill to solve the problem. So I think that's something that I mean I'm looking for uh, as a as an example uh, that of course we can achieve because he was really the grand man uh, of applied mechanics. Anyway, so why is that stop working? So okay, let me just give you. Uh, give you kind of the, the general setup about the presentation. So you can see, although it's masked from uh, here, that maybe you can do this. Okay. That uh, injecting fluid in the subsurface is one of the fundamental processes of earth resource engineering. And what is geothermal uh, energy or stimulation by hydric fracturing, CO2 sequestration, that we're injecting fluid in the in the subsurface, but it's one topic that uh, I'm going to focus today is on the water flooding, and what water flooding is a is a is a way to it's what you call secondary recovery of oil oil and gas, no, but basically oil, where when it's injecting through boreholes, we're injecting water, and the water is sweeping the oil and pushing the oil, so to speak, towards the producer, the oil you know, to produce oil uh, oil and uh, and other hydrocarbons. So the, um, what's interesting, what is very uh, peculiar about it is that the injection take care, takes place over months. And the whole idea is to, Im to improve the what we call the sweeping, the sweep efficiency is to induce fracture. So that has to enable a more, as I said, more efficient sweep. What is being observed, um, what is being observed in those, in those weak rocks where we, we, we uh, do this water flooding operation is that we have a large breakdown pressure. And this, this breakdown pressure, I will explain what it is for those of you who don't know. Uh, the last breakdown pressure takes place sometimes months after the start of the injection. And you can see here, uh, even though those are field data, and of course we can never be sure when we have field data, but we can see here that there is a peak of pressure that is called the breakdown pressure, which takes place approximately about three, four months after injection started. No? And the question is that why is it so large? Uh, and especially on the view of the fact that those rocks are very weak rocks, they are very permeable, and they expect to have very, very low fracture toughness. So that uh, Conventional explanation is to invoke plasticity, to say there's plasticity around the tip, plasticity around, around the borehole. Just a few words about breakdown pressure. Now, if you look at, at the picture on the right here, where you have, a, you have a borehole and then you have a fracture being, hydric fracture being induced by injection of fluid, what we observe is that, first of all, there's a phase of pressurization where the pressure increases more or less linearly with time. And then you have the peak breakdown where you have kind of initiation and unstable fracture propagation that causes a drop in the, in the pressure, and then you have propagation. And so the question is that if we look at the very classical work that goes back to about 40 years by uh, Emerson and Ferrers, we see that an expression for the breakdown pressure, which is related in a sense to the far field stress using a very classical Kirch solution from elasticity and using concept of tensile strength. So, those are... so the question that we have is that, um, can we still use those expression? And obviously not because you no, know, uh, they completely under predict the, the, the peak pressure, the breakdown pressure. And the question is that what is the cause of it? Can we develop a model to explain that? Okay. And I just want to, to, if you look at the bottom of the picture here, you see that the slide, you see that we have uh, uh, rocks, those weak sandstone, that, that's really the target of my presentation today, which are characterized by very large permeability of, about, of the other one Darcy, which is extremely large. No? 
Okay, so um, the field data that I show you are kind of always ambiguous because, I mean, the petroleum, uh, petroleum company don't like to spend time uh, analyzing data. You know? So the data are there, so they don't do even experiment that are specific designed for, to answer a scientific question. So, but the lab data that, uh, that exists, and they were done by uh, many years ago by, by BP and by Atera Tech in, the, uh, in Salt Lake City. And the, those were injection tests made in a, in a block of sandstone, a very, very weak sandstone, and so weak that you can, you can see from the, the sigma C, which is a UCS, the unconfined compressive strength of about one megapascal. So it is a rock which is so soft that you can basically scratch with you. With you you need okay and so they did experiment uh, injection experiment uh, trying to to see what would be the breakdown pressure and what you see on the left here on the um, the, the, the the on the, the the black the black line here is the uh, injection the, the pressure measured in the in the borehole as a function of time and you can see here the kind of the step it means that the the injection rate has been increased by step. No, the rock is so permeable that uh, instantaneously the pore pressure equilibrates in the in in the block, so that we have steady state in the block. And so, if you look at uh, the left hand side here, this is the, the the injection pressure, and here you see the arrow with prediction by according to the Hampson Ferrers criterion. You see that the peak pressure that is here is way, way above the one predicted by Emerson Ferrer. So there's something else going on. And another plot here, which shows the same story, but in the, not in terms of time, but in terms of the injection rate. So the injection rate, I, re, I remind you, is increased by step. You can see that the, the injection pressure increasing basically nearly linearly with the injection, injection rate. Here's the value that is predicted according to this classical criterion. And again, the, much, much smaller than the, in, the peak injection pressure that is recorded in the experiment. Okay, so again, so the question is that what is behind, what are the phenomenon behind this, uh, this, uh, re, these results? And uh, as I said, that the conventional explanation has been to, to uh, invoke plasticity, the plasticity ring around the borehole or near the tip. But when you look at CT scan, you don't see uh, what would, would be expected from plasticity, which is, would be a kind of a blunt tip. What we see actually is an airline crack. Uh, so that means that that suggests that uh, plasticity explanation is not the right explanation because it co is contradicted by this experimental evidence from CT scan. And uh, I, I want to stress here the difference between injecting fluid in a very weak rock and injecting fluid in a granular uh, medium. And because of the difficulty of doing such experiment, there's been a kind of a proxy material which has been to do, rather than to do tests in a very weak rock, is to do tests in granular media. But granular media, as you can see from the picture from the right, a paper from Wang from 2012, in PRL, you see as a function of increasing viscosity or increasing injection rate, we see different pattern, but we don't really see a crack. We see displacement and, and various shape you know, of, of, of object that is being created. And that has nothing to do, if you look on the left-hand side where you see experimentals, very weak rock where you see this kind of airline crack. So clearly that what is, that I'm trying to suggest here that we, can, we should not be using uh, a plasticity. We should use fracture mechanics and recognizing that the main difference between a granular medium and the weak rock is the fact that the material is softening. And at the moment that it's softening, it is localizing, localizing in terms of, of fractures. Okay, so this, when I start to work on this a few years ago, no, we made this hypothesis that what we are observing, this kind of peak pressure that we, we observe in the, in the, certainly in the, uh, in the lab experiment is a result of a flow problem, not of a strength problem. Let me explain it. It's a result of the fact that 
we have a flow problem which is characterized by a moving boundary, the fact that you have a crack which is ex which expanding, but also which has also evolving conductivity because the conductivity of the fracture is increasing as the, the, the fracture is growing. You know? And so the hypothesis is that the so-called breakdown, this peak pressure you know, that uh, I've mentioned before, actually correspond to a transition between two flow regimes. Okay. And so the model is built on, on, on that. And then uh, assuming that linear elastic fracture mechanism is applicable, we see that from the, from the, photo, from the CD scan that we have those airline crack. And also recognizing because we have a completely different regime of fracture that conventional model of hydraulic fracture do, do not apply. Okay, and so that is the, the starting point of my, my talk. Yeah. And here I want to, to mention a little bit the difference between classical model of hydraulic fracture and the one that I'm going to, to, to discuss. No? If you look at the picture on the top, which is this classical uh, HF model. What we see, first of all, we see that uh, the, the borehole is never modeled. It is from all the models, it's always an injection point. No? That's one, 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 one point. The second one that it is based on what is called the Carter's model that the leak of velocity, the leak of is rate is proportional to the inverse of the square root of the exposure time. This is uh, the, the base of, of that model is uh, it is a cake, cake building on, on the face of the fracture, but it can also be interpreted as the solution, the, the early time solution of the diffusion equation when you have the square root of time behavior. And then finally, that um, the key of any fracture models that are on the market uh, is also a conservation of fluid in the sense that the the, fluid that you, the volume of fluid that you are injecting is partitioned in two parts. One is the volume of the fracture and the other one is the volume of fluid that is leaking into the medium. So what's the difference with the model that I'm going to, to discuss? First of all, the, 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 there is a borehole. That's the first, the first thing that is, has a finite size. That fluid can leak from the, the, borehole, the borehole surface, the borehole boundary that is indicated in red, in red here, but also that we need to take into account the fact that the, the power pressure field takes, the, the perturbation of the power pressure takes place over a region large compared to the fracture, and therefore the, the, the power pressure is, is controlled by the diffusion equation. So we are uh, facing a completely different problem in terms of uh, the modeling assumption. Okay, so, uh, so the, the key assumption that I'm going to make in, the, in, in what I'm going to present uh, is, is here. First of all, it's a kind of a toy model in a sense, try to understand what is going on. And it's going to be 2D, what we call that, for those of you who are in hydraulic fashion, you call that the KGD, the Christian Wiggs, Gerf, Matt de Klerk model. It's a 2D, plain strain model. The, the material is very weak. So we assume that there's no toughness, zero toughness. And an important point that there's so much fluid leaking to the medium that the amount of fluid in the fracture itself is negligible. So we can forget about the storage of fluid in the fracture itself. And the final important assumption is to say that the fracture propagates in the quasi-steady pore pressure region around the borehole. So if, um, if you, look at the, the solution of the diffusion equation, which is due to, to the continuous source injecting fluid into, into the medium. What you find the solution is well known. It's known for about 100, more than 100 years. It is given by so-called exponential integral. And the particularity of this solution is that in a region which is growing like square root of time, this, you can see that R proportional to the square root of time, the, the diffusion equation simplified to Laplace equation. So it is what we call pseudo steady state. The pressure is still evolving with time, but it is evolving because the boundary is moving away from, from, the, uh, from the borehole, okay? And so the assumption that I'm going to make here is that uh, the, the fracture is going to propagate in this region where the, 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 there is a pseudo steady state. No? So that, uh, Okay, so that's the, 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 the last assumption. So in a sense, it's going to be kind of a large time asymptotics of, of the solution. 
Okay, so that's, that's, that's the setup. And despite all, you can see that I've made a lot of approximation to simplify the problem. And still you can, if you count the parameters, there are 10 physical parameters in this problem. Uh, it's a lot. Uh, I know some of you are working on machine learning here, but you know, it's a lot for, for a modeler. But I will show you that, I mean, uh, I will show you that actually by doing what we call scaling analysis, you can drastically reduce the number of parameters. You know? And actually, besides space and time, I will show that we can only, it only depends on two parameters. One is a scale radius of the borehole, that's alpha k. And the other one is something which is proportional to the famous biot coefficient, biot coefficient alpha, you know? and nu is the Poisson ratio. Okay. So I'm going to discuss two models, a very, very simple one where I made further approximation. Um, and then another one, I, I'm just going to show you the results of, of a, a more, comprehensive, more comprehensive model. And what I call the bare bone model is, uh, is first of all saying, okay, the, this borehole again has no dimension, it's a point source, so alpha k is equal to zero. And I'm turning off the power elasticity uh, eta is equal to zero, this parameter. And by the way, this parameter eta uh, of power elasticity is, is very convenient because it contains, of course, the alpha biot coefficient, but also past the ratio, but its range is between zero and one half. And a, a good number, by the way, if you look at data for, for, for rocks, it's, it's not far, the eta is not far from 0 0.25, okay? All right, so um, scaling analysis, so, this is always a bit tricky to do, but basically what you do, you reformulate, you reformulate the, the, the model in terms of dimensionless quantities, you introduce scales, no? and then you identify the scale by, by trying to put dimensionless group to, to one. And what you see expression here for two scales, one is a time, the TK, and the other one is a length scale. You, you, re, you recognize some of the, of the parameters. Q is going to be the injection rate, mu is the viscosity, and so on. What is very unusual in this problem is that um, typically what we have when we do scaling analysis, we get monomials like, like the, the expression for LK where you have power law. No? Uh, something which is very unusual here is the fact that you have an exponential. And the, the, to trace the exponential, it has to come, it is coming from the asymptotics of the, the source solution, this kind of exponential integral, which they generate into a logarithm, and that the exponential is actually coming from that. No? So it is extremely unusual uh, uh, case of, of, of scaling. No? So when, when you do that, and you introduce scale also for the pressure and the aperture uh, and the leak off, what you find at the end is that there are no parameters left. So uh, let me just pick up two, two quantities at the bottom here. One is the opening, W is the opening, the P is the pressure. So you have a scale here, which we can identify. And then the rest is a parameter, it's a field, which is only a function of position and time. So, the, so that will be the aperture field of the fracture. And similarly, you have for the pressure and, and the leak of rate. And then I will also uh, attract your attention to L. L is the fracture length, which is increasing with time. And we scale in a certain way that we say that it's going to be proportional to, to square root of time. The, the, but also a, a parameter here, which in general is a function of time. Okay? So it is kind of the way to scale. You can see from that by, by doing the scaling, which of course I, I didn't have time to go into the detail, is that all the parameters are gone. All the parameters are being absorbed in the scales. So the only thing that you are left is position and time, okay? So therefore that then you can start to look at the, equa look at the equation and start to solve it, okay? Okay, so um, what is the, the model about, uh, the, the mathematical about? So we, we, we try to use, I try to use um, as much as possible take advantage of the linearity of the problem. So the, the only nonlinearity in this problem is coming actually from the lubrication equation. The fact that the flow in the, in the, in the, in the, in the fracture, the, uh, there's a, there's a, there's a hydraulic conductivity, which is going to be proportional to the cube of the aperture. That is a very strong, it's a very strong nonlinearity. 
but it is the only nonlinearity in the problem. The, the domain outside the fracture is elastic, even actually it's going to be power elastic. And we have also diffusion equation, which is linear. So we take advantage of that. And we take advantage of that by actually mimicking the, the fracture by recognizing that the fracture, the hydric fracture is a region where the, across which the displacement is discontinuous and the, the, the flux is discontinuous. That means that we can replace the fracture mathematically by what we call displacement discontinuity a, a solution, dislocation dipole solution, and source solution, which are flux discontinuities. No? The advantage of doing that, that we reduce all the problem on to a term of quantities, which are only defined along the fracture locus. No? We don't need to solve the, the, the main problem. All right, so that, that is, the, the, that is the, the, the approach. I have only two, two, two slides, I think, where we have equations. I just have to, to show you at least one, just to tell you that the type of equation that we need to deal with, no? Well, the, the first one is, is the lubrication equation. You can see that um, here the, the omega cube, which is the opening cube, which is the, the, this nonlinear term in the, in, in the model, that's lubrication theory. Then we have here a post-medium flow. So what that means that we have that, if, if I can decode that a little bit, this logarithm is actually the, the source solution, the, 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 long -term, the long term asymptotics of the source solution, that there's a logarithm here. And here what we have is this, the log is actually, the, it's a convolution of, of the log, which is the source solution along, placed along the fracture in order to mimic the flux discontinuity, the leak off. Okay, so that you have this integral equation with a with a uh, weak kernel, and then we have the elasticity solution, which is mimicked using dislocation uh, dipoles. You can see here we have hypersingular in integral, uh, and then we have also the fracture propagation criterion, which can express in terms of the weight function. We can express that uh, if you could recall that we have I'm assuming zero toughness. It means that the asymptotics of the aperture is proportional to the, to the, to the distance from the tip four to uh, three thirds. Okay, so that is th those are the set of equations. So it is not simple, but but it can be done. Okay, so ba basically what we do, we 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 decompose the the problem in term of, in term of segment. And for each segment, we're assuming that the displacement jump and the flux jump is, is uniform of each segment. So we get at the end a nonlinear system of equation that uh, that can be um, that can that can be solved. Okay, so that's what that's what we need to solve. Um, I've not said something uh, actually quite important is the fact that the, the by the very way the this problem is being modeled. Uh, is that we are not solving actually an evolution equation. We are solving the problem at a time. So we can look at the time, solve the solution, look at another time, solve the equation, and we have to check consistency, meaning that, for example, that the fracture at the new time must be longer than the fracture at the previous time. Okay? But we don't solve an evolution problem. It is because simply because of the way uh, I'm, because I'm looking at this large time asymptotics uh, of the uh, of the source solution. Okay. All right. So, so the first thing to do once we have done we have formulated the model is to look at what we call similarity solution, you know, which are kind of early time or large time solution. You can see the the way the way we we do it. You no, know, it's very very classical is to say that for example let's take the opening. The opening is a function of position and time. We say it's a function of position times multiply by a power law of time. Okay, and you do that for each field. You plug that into the equation. You balance the terms, and what you find that you have actually two asymptotic uh, regime. And why you have two asymptotic regime? Because if you look at the first set of equation here, with, with lubrication, leak off, and elasticity. We can identify relationship between the time exponent here. We can see the expression here. But the porous medium flow has actually three terms in the equation. So we can only balance two. It's called dominant balance. We can only balance two terms, no? And we can, one, one set 
is you can see that in red is a set that you balance at small time, and the, the other term is negligible. What I, why at large time you balance other two other terms, and the, the first term here that you can neglect. So, so you get out of that you get two asymptotic flow regime, the small time and the large time, which is characterized by certain, each one by a certain set of time exponents. Okay, so we. We can we can actually identify two solutions, and, and of course it's are simpler because so we we have eliminated time completely from from the uh, we can we can we can eliminate time basically that's what is those are those kind of similarity what so called similarity solution. Okay, so maybe that maybe that's more on the interesting part, which is more the what do we do we get out of that? Well, I like to think. Uh, like in general, to think in terms of time scale and length scale. So, um, so you can see that two asymptotic regime, why one that I call rock flow, we call rock flow. And uh, if I if if you can picture back by the picture back the, 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 the sketch that I drew where, where I had the borehole and two fractures, no, and then fluid leaking from, from the borehole and fluid leaking via the fractures uh, leaking to the medium, well, you can imagine that we have two limiting cases. You have one case, which turned out to be the early time solution, where there's no flow in the fracture, even though the fracture may exist, but there's no fluid going to the, going, or negligible amount of fluid going to the fracture and leaking to the medium, and all the fluid is leaking from the borehole. And the other case, which is this large time asymptotics, we actually, Negligible fluid is amount of fluid is leaking from the borehole, and everything is leaking via the fracture. So you have those two modes. No, okay. So and you can see that from 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 the picture here, from from on, on the left, you see this kind of uh, the power pressure field around the around the fracture. You see that the it's you see radial flow. That means that the power pressure field is absolutely unaffected by the presence of the fracture. It means that the fracture, I, we use the word, is hydraulically invisible. It is there, but it is not affecting the flow problem. While if you look at the large time solution, you see that the, the, the borehole is invisible. It is, it is everything, you can see those kind of elliptical flow pattern. I, in the literature, it's not clear what is the, uh, how we characterize it. We, I mean, we call linear flow because if you go perpendicular to the fracture plane, you can see that the the leak off is going to be uh, the pattern is going to be uh, of, of the specific discharge vector is going to be more or less perpendicular to the fracture plane, but but uh, we see a completely different pattern. So uh, in asymptotically, okay. The interesting part is when you look at the, the injection pressure, and what you see that in the early part when it is what is rock flow dominate when you have this radial flow. Actually, the fracture, the pressure is increasing with time as a log. No, that's coming from this uh, source solution. But in the fracture flow regime, it is actually decaying as a power of time to two to the minus one four. So you have increase in the radial flow, decrease in the in the fracture flow problem. And so you can imagine now you can picture that indeed the peak pressure has nothing to do with a breakdown, so-called breakdown, is simply is a switch between two flow patterns, you know, from radial to, to, to linear. It is the fact that the flow domain is actually, the boundary of the flow domain is, 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 is evolving, and the conductivity of the fracture is evolving. So here, in the, on the left, the conductivity is so small and the rock so permeable that it is, the fracture is, 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 is invisible. Okay. And then you see a different, completely different pattern. Here, omega again is the aperture, the pi is, is the net, what we call the net pressure, so pressure minus the far field stress. In red, you see the early time solution, blue, the, the, the large time solution. You see for the pressure in, in at early time, you get this log singularity. So you have this kind of a very high pressure, very large gradient of near the, near the borehole. But you see completely different pattern for the for the pressure and the opening oops, uh, and the opening uh, in early time and large time. And you see on on the on the left here expression 
for those asymptotics for the small time and large time asymptotics. Okay, so that's what we we get uh, out of this uh, this model. Uh, I just want to say a few words uh, about the deep asymptotics. Now it turns out that whenever you do uh, ad refreshing modeling, you need to be very careful about the deep asymptotics. No, because it's moving boundary. It's some kind of Stefan problem somehow. It's a moving boundary problem. And if you don't get the correct asymptotics at, at the moving boundary, you get the solution, you get incorrect solution, okay? So certainly from the point of view of the, uh, of the aperture, and we know already from, that's from linear elastic fracture mechanics that it has to be of that form. The fact, the fact that it's connected, that, the, 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 that we have the, the Laplace equation that legislates the pore pressure field around the fracture implies automatically that we cannot have a singularity in the, in the fluid pressure. So the fluid pressure is regular. And also it means also that the leak off is very regular. It's very different from the Carter leak off, you know, that uh, where you get actually a singularity uh, at, at the tip. So it, it is completely different behavior for the solution. Okay. And the solution that I, um, that I just showed you before, this solution, uh, I had a lot of detail, but a, a few lies uh, behind what I said, because what I should have said, you know, and I'm telling you now, that the similarity solution, a global similarity solution, they break down near the tip and near the inlet, because we need to satisfy, in particular, for example, we, we need to satisfy those conditions at, at the tip. Uh, and then we, what we see that when we look at the more, co more complex model, more uh, realistic model, we see actually the appearance of boundary layers uh, near, near, near the inlet and near, near the tip of the fracture. Okay, that's something else. Okay, so what is the, what is the what I would call the enhanced model? No, uh, it's no, it's no. I think there is no equation anymore. I think uh, at this stage, so don't worry. Uh, so what we add? We add one thing. We add the borehole. Okay, so that means that we we introduce another parameter, which is the radius of the borehole divided by this characteristic length, and we add the bio, uh, a bio, the bio coefficient alpha. So this. Uh, that so, and what, what does that express? It expresses the fact that as the power pressure is increasing, if, if it's unconstrained, the, mat, the, the material is going to, to uh, there's going to be dilation, okay, uh, of, of the material due to an increase of the power pressure under condition where it is unconstrained, okay. And so now the solution, even though that, uh, that 10 parameters, no, it's depend on space and time as before, but but it has it, we have two numbers here, which characterize you now the, the this solution, this enhanced solution of, of the of the problem. Okay. Okay. So um, with same 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 uh, tools, no, we're using those what is called edge dislocation solution from, but with a twist, the, the solution this dislocation dislocation solution, as you may know. Is simply uh, the, the jump, a constant jump from, from zero to a point to infinity, constant jump in displacement. But the solution that we are using was developed actually by Dundurs, famous Dundurs from uh, was at Northwestern University, uh, that takes automatically into account the existence of a hole. So we don't need to, in other words, we don't need to model explicitly the bow hole. And similarly, the, 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 the flux discontinuity is modeled by, no, by poroelastic uh, source, source solution, but in order to take into account the borehole, we need to put a sink inside, 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 the, inside the borehole in order to, to, meet, to meet the boundary condition at the borehole. Okay, and that you can see picture here of the, of the, the flow line uh, in the case where in the, when we have this uh, source sink, you know. So obviously the solution is physical only outside the borehole. It has, it has no physical meaning inside the borehole. It's just a mathematical trick, you know, to, to, uh, to satisfy the boundary, the boundary condition, okay? So that is the tool. And then we, we, we use the same type of formalism as before. There's no need to, to, uh, to, to go back to, to that, but 
what I want to show now is is is, is results, our results, and um, these two parameters which are important, you know, in a sense, which summarize the solution. One is what we call, search of a better word, is what we call the fracture fluid fraction. So it is, uh, some, uh, it is telling you how much of the fluid is partitioned between the fracture and the borehole. Remember that early time, all the fluid is leaking from the borehole. At large time, all the fluid is leaking from the fracture. At early time, phi is equal to uh, to, uh, to zero, large time phi equal to one, okay? So that's one parameter which encapsulates the solution. Another one is the fracture length, no? As I told you, we, we introduced this kind of a lambda, which is fracture length divided by the square root of time, uh, we, uh, 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 and then the uh, uh, scaling parameters. And so we can start to, to imagine that we, we are what we call, again, the phase diagram, so in search of a be better word, where on the one axis we have the, this fluid fraction, which tells you uh, the partitioning of the fluid between the borehole and the fracture. And the other one is the, the, this lambda coefficient that tells you how the fracture is evolving compared to a target, which is square root of time. Okay? Okay, so let me let me explain a little bit on that. So we start in a sense, remember, we start from phi equals zero because that's the early time solution. And uh, we we end up um, at, at the point which we which we call the F vertex, which, which is when all the fluid is um, leaking in the medium via via the fracture. Okay. So those are trajectories of the solution in that space. You can think of them that they are par parameterized with respect to time. So as time is evolving, you are moving from the, the left edge towards this F vertex, which is the kind of large time solution. Okay. Now, if as long as the solution is near near this um, this is near this um, edges of the, the phase, it means that phi equal to zero. That means that you have only radial flow. You don't see. Even though the fracture is propagating from the borehole, it's not being seen from the from 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 the pore pressure field. So, but eventually, no, it is leaving, and as it is leaving, lambda is increasing, and progressively going into um, into towards the F. No, this uh, you can see a third vertex here, which is called I, which is actually the earlier solution. It means that. When the, the borehole is very small, you can see uh, that all the solutions are, are the different colors correspond to different borehole size. No, when the borehole size becomes very small, actually the solution, what it does, it just follow this edge here. It means that it evolving, but it remains radial flow. It, uh, it reaches high vertex or the neighborhood of the high vertex, which means that the borehole is very small compared to the fracture. The, the fracture length, but there is still a radial flow, and then it eventually uh, moves towards the uh, this F vertex where you have fracture flow. Okay, so that's the way to decode. And what we you, what you see also in dashed and and continuous line, the fact that if eta equal to zero, there is no polarity effect. With eta is equal to 0.5, you have the maximum polarity effect. So you see that you have actually the uh, um, Slowing down in a sense, no, of, of the solution due to, to, to polarity. And finally, here the, the, the black line tells you in this space when this is, when the peak, the pressure becomes at the peak. So you can see that as it is evolving, for example, let's say the yellow line it is evolving along this, this trajectory, the pressure is increasing and then it reach a peak and then it's decreasing. Okay, so that's the, the this, this diagram. So kind of encapsulate the, the whole solution. And you can see here more in, in terms of the pore pressure field, what is the shape of the solution. Uh, early time, you see the borehole, the fracture exists, but it does not affect the, the, the radial flow. The fracture is invisible. If you, if you go via this A vertex, meaning that the, the borehole is small enough compared to a certain length scale, you don't see the borehole, you still see the radial flow, you don't see the effect of the fracture. And at the end, the large time is that you only see the, the fracture, you don't see the borehole. Okay, so that's 
the type of solution that 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 you are that you are getting. Okay. Um, I see that I'm maybe running a bit of out of time. Let me just say at this stage that um, we have boundary layers. We have boundary layers uh, near near what we call the high vertex, and we uh, the high vertex we have boundary layers, which is due to, to the nonlinearity. And we can construct those. We can construct numerically at least those boundary layers, which change actually the nature of the solution in the those, those boundary region, but does not affect uh, the general solution. You know, it, it will it will not, for example, affect uh, if I look at uh, at this uh, at this plot at those plots here, which kind of summarize the evolution of the on the left of the aperture of the fracture at the borehole and on the right the injection pressure also the pressure of the borehole as a function of time it does not affect the general shape not those boundary layers but it affects a bit the magnitude so so you have to you have to be careful when you construct a solution that indeed you take that into account but numerically we can take that into account okay so let me let me maybe show you a couple of um, couple of, uh, try to explain uh, two of those graphs here. The, the, first of all, you have different colors, mean, mean that different pro-elastic effects, uh, zero, eta equal zero, or eta equal 0 0.5, which is maximum. So, but you can see that um, in those plots, which are log-log, you know, you don't see a lot of effect, but still, when you look at the expression here, for example, for the aperture, we see that uh, we see how the eta co this probability coefficient enters the enters the uh, the expression for the uh, for the aperture. So we see uh, different the dashed line correspond to asymptotics, no. Uh, but what you, and those different lines set of lines that you see are for different uh, radius of the borehole. So uh, that would be. The, on the left, the one, the, up, the, the one the most on the left would correspond to a borehole size of 10 minus 3. The one on the right would be a borehole size of, of, of the 10. If you look at field data, we find that the alpha k, the range of alpha k could be between 10 minus 1 to 10 minus 2 uh, about that range. So we, we see we can, con we can construct a solution as, you, as I, as I saw, said before. The solution depends on only on two on two parameters, no, besides time, of course, on this borehole size scale and this probability coefficient eta. Okay, but you see the same pattern here. But from a from a point of view of uh, engineering, we see here the injection pressure, and we see the again what we already obtained in the in the very simple model without borehole and without elasticity. We see the same pattern. Let's take, for example, the set of lines which in the middle corresponding to alpha k equal 0 0.1. We see first of all an increase of, 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 the, of the, the injection pressure, then a decrease. Even though, if you look at on, on the left, even though the fracture opening at the borehole is always increasing with time. But the fact that as the fracture, as it the length of the fracture is increasing, it becomes more conductive. Causing the, the the fluid pressure to drop. Okay. Okay. So let me pass that. Um, see, no, see that. Maybe here some an example. To, I mean, we try to make an example. Of course, it's a two D model. It's a toy model. But I mean, try to make sense of of uh, of data which which are uh, plausible. Okay. And what we obtain here uh, with plausible set of data that the peak time would be, for example, in this case, one month and a half, uh, and that the, the crack length would be about at, at peak pressure would be about 1.5 meter in this case. Okay. But something that uh, I need to attract your attention is the dependence, the extreme sensitivity of the solution on the injection rate. So we, we have here. Uh, a dimensionless injection rate, no? Uh, so for example, in the field, the injection rate could be maybe a fraction of cubic meter per second, no? That would be 
for water flooding operation the kind of plausible number, we can scale it. Uh, we, first of all, we have to scale for 2D. So we have to divide by the thickness of the reservoir. Then we scale by kappa, which is the mobility, and the difference between the, the, the far field stress and the far field pore pressure. So that is, you know, we, um, we see that, look at the expression for TK, we have this exponential. We have a term here, gamma, gamma is the Euler, Euler number, eta is this coefficient that, you, that I mentioned before, that you see here uh, in the numerator, you see this uh, dimension injection rate, no? but you have an exponential. So what does that mean? Well, it means that uh, if I is, is small than one, but small than one, if you look at the numbers here, you get a, a, a characteristic time which is so large that you can only observe radial flow. That's the very practical implication of that. That no, you, you cannot, even though the fracture may develop, no, you will never see the, the signature of the fracture hydraulically. No? Actually, you can play with those numbers and, and you put possible numbers, you get the, the, the size of the, the, the age of the universe very rapidly when you have this exponential, okay? On the other hand, remember that we have this restriction on the, um, on, on the cons when the solution was constructed and the restriction was that the, 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 the fracture was only propagating this region of pseudo steady state, no? And that was the, the base on, on, on which this, this, model, this model was developed. Well, it turns out that uh, you can, practically speaking, you cannot go beyond four because if you inject this dimension injection rate goes beyond four, that means that you, the assumption, that key assumption of the model is, no, uh, uh, is, 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 is not, not um, acceptable anymore. So it's not, uh, confirmed. So, so we have, in a sense, the model applies on this small range, in a sense, between about one, one and four, but it turns out that you now when you look at field data, that those are plausible ranges, you know, even though that it's a very small uh, range. But it tells you that you have, uh, indeed, you, know, you have restriction to the solution. I will just show you, because I, it will only take me two minutes to show you simply result for for the lab, exp lab experiment. So we can do exactly the same, same type of thing by, by looking now at, 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 a, at a finite domain, not an infinite domain like before. Uh, we gain the one thing by looking at finite domain that we, time is gone completely because you know, we, uh, we have steady state uh, directly. And therefore, before what, 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 uh, what we found that, well, there was a critical time below which you know, the fracture was propagating the injection pressure increasing. And then beyond this critical time, the fracture was propagating with, with the pressure decreasing. We call quote unquote unstable. No, it's not maybe the appropriate word, but it's the fact that the fracture propagates with decreasing pressure. Um, but when you look at the, the, the laboratory experiment, because time is gone completely, well, we replace time in sense by the injection rate. So in the sense that the crack is stable, it propagates on the increasing pressure when the, when the injection rate is below a critical value, it's unstable if the injection rate is above a certain critical value, okay? And so we, um, we, we, we can do exactly the same formalism, it's a bit, Bit more tedious because we can we can we use source solution dislocation solution even to mimic what's happening on the finite boundary, but what you see here uh, are um, look at at the the figure on the right here. This is the injection pressure. This is not time. What you see on on the bottom, it is the injection injection rate. So I, I can imagine in my mind that no, the injection rate is, is increasing increasing progressively. And what you see that, that you have um, a pressure, the, the fluid pressure increasing first, the injection pressure increasing first with increasing injection rate. And then you reach a peak at which the, 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 the pressure is decreasing. And that is uh, with in, increasing injection rate. So that means that actually the fracture is unstable. And that takes place more or less, sorry, 
for this particular set of parameters, because here we have, uh, we have toughness in particular, we have the size of the, the domain as one of the parameters. But the, for the particular set of parameter, parameters that we have used for those simulation, well, the, the peak pressure takes place more or less for this configuration when lambda, a measure of the crack length, is equal to 0 0.4. That is depicted here. So you see we're, we're nearly transiting, transitioning, sorry, between a radial flow regime to a, to a fracture flow regime you know, at that. You know. uh, and, and, what, and so again, so we see the same picture that even though that no, it's not time, but it's injection rate, but we see that we have, uh, we have, we have for, for a certain range of injection rate, we have stable crack propagation with increasing injection pressure. And that again explains the fact that why the injection, the peak pressure that we observe has nothing to do with the, uh, with the break pressure. And you can see that again, summarized on this diagram here, the diagram is, um, this is the last slide, by the way, uh, before the conclusion. Uh, the this diagram kind of it explains 3D, obviously. We have a 2D model, so we have to make some, some kind of a assumption. But you know, again, so we, we have to, to do a bit of tuning in a sense. But it remains the fact true that you know, uh, if you look at the, the the borehole injection pressure versus injection rate, no? we see here this, this classical breakdown pressure, which is way beyond the data, the data, the data points from, from experiment. And the data, you can see the, the peak, the peak pressure is way above the, 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 the classical breakdown pressure, but we are at least able by tuning, playing a bit of the parameters, we are able at least to feed the, feed the data. So, I mean, it's not a proof, but it's simply to tell you that the model is, appears to be consistent with the experiment that we uh, that that we run actually by by BP and, and Teratech. Okay, and that uh, that that is the length of the fracture versus in, in the injection rates. So indeed, we have this fracture propagating, but it is a stable regime of of crack propagation, which leads to this again this increase of the injection rate. So, uh, conclusion. I think, I, I hope that I've, I've persuaded you that the peak has nothing to do with the strength problem. It's not an instability problem. It's simply a, ch a change of regime, a flow regime. That, that, I think that's the, the most important point. The second thing is that maybe more philosophical uh, point is that obviously it's, it's a simple model. It's a 2D model. Uh, it's simply maybe a model to think. No, to see what are the important parameters, but maybe to show that that the sensitivity of, of the solution to this injection rate. No, in a sense, tell, it tells you we never know. We never know exactly what is kappa. We never know what are what, what is the size of the power pressure. That we have to accept the fact that we there are situations where we cannot predict because simply do, we don't have robustness in 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 in, in the modeling. We have too much sensitivity, sensitive dependence of the solution on some parameters. And just and knowing that is important because that means that you have to track, if you, you don't do numerical simulation that are so sensitive to parameters that you don't know, but use try to use field operation to try to optimize the process, knowing that it is very sensitive. And finally, uh, is something that, um, the, what is the value besides that? What could be the value of models like that? Well, as I said before, that those are difficult problems. No, it is there really at the intersection, if you think about it, there is this intersection of Laplace or diffusion equation, lubrication theory, and elasticity. And those three theories have to merge together and be consistent with each, with each other. No, it's a moving boundary problem. Those are very tough problems to produce. And so I would say that. Models like that are useful in a sense simply as a benchmark you know, for numerical models. Eventually, we have to do numerical models. It's obvious if we want to do, especially if we want to do in three, if we have to move in 3D, 3D we need to do numerical modeling, but we have to, to check the validity. We have to calibrate those models to make sure that the algorithm provides the, 
the correct are, are safe and provides the correct solution. Okay, so that's, and then all this work has been published here and then uh, the details, the, the dirty details are in those, in, in those publications. Okay, thank you very much. I'm sorry that I took a bit more time, but we, we, were, we were starting late, I think. Thank you. <clears throat> No, no, it just, you just have to, to check if the, the solution is consistent. That means that does it evolve correctly, no? And evolving correctly means that the, the, the crack is length is increasing indeed with time. If it was decreasing, it would be a, a very serious problem <laughs> in, in the solution. So that is the, is the length of the crack, which is this, this, the only thing which in a sense, you have changed the configuration of the domain. And that can only be in one direction. In the sense, if not, you would have to deal with crack healing. But of course, that's what not what we we that we're doing. Yeah. Uh, for the beginning, you talked about the dimension analysis that you put up your model. Uh, I have one the concern, or I want to learn what the kind of the state of the art, like uh, how we like getting the field data. To validate this type of model, particularly for this kind of geothermal application, we know the materials uh, like even young modular structure uh, toughness or changing with pressure. So for like um, you are like uh, using the pressure like produce the structure, then uh, we all like uh, make the bond truly mingle together. I see your like map that they you just uh, the regular constant of pressure. Like, uh, like I'm not, I'm I'm talking about what the huge pressure uh, that can be changed by just with the fracture. But in the real application, it can change it significantly. So I'm wondering whether this kind of pressure is used that material properly change how big the impact is to the field. Um, yeah, so you're putting a bit more reality into, yeah. into the problem. I think you, you mentioned two things. You mentioned, I think, uh, first of all, this kind of scaling argument, no? Uh, and the second thing is about the, uh, the impact. In terms of scaling, I mean, you, obviously, if you have, for example, a parameter which depends on pressure, so you can, of course, you have nonlinearity, an extra nonlinearity problem, but you can always start with a reference value of, of these parameters. For example, let's say Young's modulus, no? You could take Young's modulus at, at, at the reference stress, which is, which is relevant to your problem. And then you can use that as uh, in the scaling analysis. Obviously, you are going to have a function somewhere in your, in your solution, which depends on the, the stress because it's reflecting the, the, the dependence of the elastic modulus on, 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 on the stress. So that's, that's the first thing. So it does not invalidate the scaling analysis means that it's slightly more complicated. You need to take into account. Um, in terms of, you, you, are making, you are making obviously a good, a good point about realism. So my answer would be that there are two ways to do it, no? Uh, is to look at, at different value, no? In a sense, you can see, if, especially if you've done scaling, you, you use different value of, I mean, Let's, let's even look at the simpler case. Here, of course, everything has been linearized, but you could sim simply assume that you have different value of the parameters. In this case, it, it simply changes scaling factor. So it means that the, 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 assuming that the, para so you freeze the parameters in a sense, but you look at different value of these parameters, which translate to different value of the scaling factors. And so that, that but, uh, 
we we are we we are in this field of ge geomechanics. No, <laughs> there's nothing you can do. We are, we are all, always going to be data poor. No, uh, sorry for the for those of you who are in uh, in uh, machine learning, <laughs> where you need data. But we are always going to be data poor. No, um, so so I mean what this type of model, uh, as I said, is is an attempt to try to understand and have the right physics. In, I mean, at least more relevant physics, rather than, than to try to predict exactly what's going to happen. Okay, so, no. um, thank you very much. Um, I'm just uh, say that I, I think there's work on numerical methods and not on But I'm going to ask something uh, maybe very simple question. Um, the initial model assumes that you have two tracks going forward. Um, why, for example, not assume that you have more, more tracks in, in different direction, or why not one track? Why, why you assume that you have two tracks? I mean, there's any assumption behind that? Or? Yeah, so the, the, the multiple crack, uh, we are completely controlled by the far field stress. So if, if, if we have a small anisotropy in the far, in, in the far field stress, let's assume that the fracture is vertical, and the, then the fracture is always going to orient itself normal to the minimum principal stress. So that means that you no, know, it will be very difficult to, uh, under hydraulic fracturing con condition, to generate multiple fractures in different directions. You can do that if you use explosive. You, know? you, can, you can generate a radial pattern of, of fractures, but not the hydraulic fracture. The second point about symmetry, one fracture versus two fractures, if you do a fracture mechanic analysis, no, you find that actually the, the stable configuration is actually to have something, two fractures which are symmetric. No? Because if you have only one, you are going to start to increase the stress intensity factor on, on another one, and that, that one will, will, will develop. So it seems to be the, the, the stable solution. So it's, a good it's a good assumption, exactly, yes. No, but the other, so if that one, develop, one develops, the other one is going to become unstable and then, and then follow up. So, so I think that having two symmetric one is, is, uh, is an appropriate, is an appropriate solution. Can I check if there's a question from the audience yeah. online in the chat? Ah. Uh, this one here? Ah, yeah, two chat. Okay, three chat. Okay. Well, somebody has to leave. <laughs> so you showed the inner solution and the outer solution for the carbon. Yes. Were you able to match them? Yes. Uh, oh, okay. That's how yeah. you get the peak pressure on the. No, 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 that's, that has nothing. The, the peak pressure has nothing to do with the, the matching, you know. Uh, the peak pressure is, is simply a reflection of the changing configuration of the problem. So, so as, as the, the fracture becomes larger and larger, they open up. And if they open up, they become more conductive. If they become more conductive, more fluid is going to, move, to, to enter the fracture rather than to leak from the borehole. And so this, this balance between two, two things, no? The, but it affects the, the, the matching and the, the boundary layers affects the magnitude of the, of the inject, injection pressure. So you, you, that's why you get, get it right no? Yeah. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, in what sense advection? Because, I mean, yeah, so, so the, the medium is saturated. No, we, we, we inject fluid, of course, no. It's, a lot, it's saturated, yes, it's, it's oil. We, of course, we made the same assumption that the, the same viscosity, no, but no, it's not actually, in terms of diff, diffus, diffusivity coefficient, it's, it's not that different between 
the, if you look at the oil in place, which has different viscosity and, 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 and uh, compressibility than the, the water. So it's not that different. So, I mean, you need to make approximation, you need to make assumption, and then of course, then, then try to relax them one at a time, but sometimes it's not possible. Again, you have to, so some stage, you need, if multi-phase fl flow is, is important, you need to, to, to buy the bullet and, <laughs> and do the hard work, but at least you can, this is, is a starting point in a sense. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks.